Hello and welcome to this week's Productivity Enhancer. Today we look at part two of Blur Tools in Photoshop. Last week we took a look at the blur tools on the tool palette which have been in Photoshop for ages and ages. But now let's take a look at the blur gallery that I mentioned earlier. So we're going to go up and check out this different photograph here. We have some prickly pear, desert cactus flowers, and uh, you can see we have different fields of focus. What we want is this center flower to be in focus while everything else is just kind of blurred. So to access our blur gallery, we just go to filter, drop that down, and you can see blur gallery right here. Our short key is going to be control F. Then you can see that the blur gallery is open, and here we have our blur tools. We have field blur, we have iris blur, and tilt shift. We're going to run through each one of these individually, so let's go ahead and unclick our iris blur for now and just work with the field blur. So I'm going to twirl this triangle. So what we notice with the field blur is that our whole photograph is blurred slightly. In this case, it's blurred by 15 pixels. And you can see that we have this pin right in the dead center of our photograph. At this point, the position of the pin isn't important. What it's doing is it's just controlling the blur for the entire photograph. So at this point, it's just like we added a Gaussian blur of 15 pixels to this photograph. And this is also a great place to point out that the blur gallery is non-destructive editing as well. And we'll see how that's accomplished in a minute. But first, you can see that we have a few different controls for the field blur. We can manipulate the amount of blur by spinning this dial around the pin, and you can see that it either blurs out the photograph completely, or we can manipulate it so it's a much smaller amount. But notice that the entire photograph is being blurred, not just one area. So the entire field of the photograph is being blurred with the field blur and one pin. We can move the pin, it's very mobile, or we can add pins. And by adding pins, then we get to be very specific with the amount of blur we have on specific locations, allowing us to enhance certain detail or obscure stuff that we don't want to be seen. So I'm going to place a pin right here in the center and take the blur all the way down to zero because that's going to be our subject. We want this to be absolutely crystal clear in the center and the blur kind of spreads out masking everything else towards the edges. We can also move these pins to really dial in the amount of blur and the location of it. And you can see by raising this specific dial, it blurs a radius, and uh, that radius is particular to that specific dial. So we can move these out, just uh, blur everything that we don't want seen. I want to blur this branch a little better. Maybe bring this down, and this one over here. And that looks pretty good there. You can see that our subject is nice and centered, nice and sharp, and that's the field blur. Let's take a look at the iris blur. So you can see we have another pin here right in the center, only instead of other pins, we have this orbit that kind of goes around the pin. And you can see that it has these white dots that we can use to drag in either direction, up or down, make it smaller. And we can really, really get a good feel of the location that we want to be clear and everything else that we want to be blurred. So let's just position that pin right in the center. And how the iris blur works is you can see we have these two separate orbits. We have the small orbit on the inside, which is where the blur begins. And then we have this larger orbit on the outside, which is where the blur is at its maximum. So everything outside of that larger orbit is going to be a uniform 15 pixel blur. Whereas everything between the transition between this point and this point, it's like a gradient of the blur. So that's the iris blur. Let's twirl this triangle down and check out the tilt shift. And immediately what you notice with the tilt shift is that we have these lines with the pin in the center as well. We can move this whole apparatus up or down. We can move individual parts of it up or down. But more importantly, we can tilt and shift the entire level of blur. So let's really raise this up so we can see exactly the contrast that it makes. And if we go back into the photograph area, you can see when we hover over these lines, we get arrows of different shapes and flavors. And when we grab these lines, we can move it up in any direction, move it down, we can move the whole thing, we can move just one individual line. And now comes the magic part. You can see the tilt comes into play. We can rotate that band right in the center to make it vertical, leaving everything on the edges blurry. And now if we take a look at what it's doing, you can see that everything in between the white solid bars is going to be nice and clear. And then everything on the outside of the white bar is beginning to blur. And just like in the iris, this area here is going to be the gradient, the transition between zero blur and in our case, 30 pixels of blur. 
And that way you can have a nice vertical focus in your photograph, whereas everything else is out of focus. We can even manipulate the distortion here, although on this photograph it's not going to make too much of a difference because the photograph is pretty flat to begin with. Now, the last thing I want to look at is the blur effects. Here we have some bokeh, and we can add some light bokeh or some color bokeh. And uh, what the bokeh does is it tries to find really vibrant spots of light. In most cases, it's going to be white light, but it can be any kind of light that stands out from the, the, the texture of the photograph. So once again, this photograph isn't the best example because the light is relatively flat. But let's take a look at what happens when we toggle this up a little bit. There you can see that our little bits of white are picking up and it's making almost burns in our photograph, white burns. This is a great effect if you have little orbs of light. However, like I said, this photograph isn't the best example. So let's just drag that down. The bokeh colors has absolutely nothing to do with this photograph, but you can experiment with that on your own. And even down here, we have the light range. And to be honest, the light range, I've never changed once. You can play with this on your own time, but I always find that the natural light that I choose for the actual photograph tends to be better. So let's just drag these down and see if it makes any difference here. Yeah, not very much. So you can play with the light range, but the effects will be much more noticeable on a photograph with more contrast. So we have all of our effects. Let's click OK, and then you can see that it processes these effects. And once it's all set, you can see what happens. We don't get a brand new layer. We get a smart filter with the blur gallery. And if we turn these off, you can see the difference. And to turn it back on, we need to double click on the blur gallery. Click OK and it will process it again. And there you have our photograph with a nice amount of blur, just the way we want it. So that's a review of the standard blur tools that we have in Photoshop, as well as an introduction to the blur gallery, which is brand new to CS6. It's a really powerful, really easy way to apply blur to your photographs in very specific ways. And the best part, it's non-destructive editing. So thanks for watching this week's Productivity Enhancer. I hope it's been helpful. Until next time.